So good um, afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the colloquium. Nice to see all of you. Um, I'm Jason Delborn, one of the faculty in the GES cluster. Um, you know most of you. Um, we always start if there are any announcements of GES related events or lectures or things like that coming up in the next couple of weeks. Anybody have anything that they want to announce? Okay. For the faculty, we have faculty affiliates meeting on Friday at yeah. 2 o'clock in the faculty conference. In Hill Library? In the Hill Library. Hill Library, right. Okay. That's a nice spot. Yeah, yeah. and we have food. So if you're faculty, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? As we're screaming towards the end of the semester, right? Then I will be missing the uh, affiliates meeting to uh, present at the International Society of Biosafety Research on G Bird Safety Mechanisms. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Heidi, did you have an uh, I did. Um, when registration opens tomorrow, we want you all to know that we've mentioned before that um, the author, Margaret Atwood, is coming to uh, visit us in the fall. Anyone who signs up for Colloquium or Women and Gender Studies 350 or uh, STS 403, I think, uh, the information is in the last email as well as our website, they will all read uh, the book Oryx and Crate, which has to do with genetic engineering, and participate in a conversation with Ms. Atwood before the general event later that evening. So um, we'll send out more information about it, but because she's so popular, uh, things might fill up, uh, and we wanted you guys to kind of have a heads up on it. So. Okay, well, I'm going to turn over to Fred to introduce our speaker for today. So anyway, it's my honor today to introduce Anna Whitfield, who's going to be uh, our presenter today. And Anna uh, got her uh, master's degree at UC Davis um, in uh, plant, bio, plant pathology and uh, in University of Wisconsin, again, in plant pathology. And she's been studying for a long time the interaction of viruses and plants and resistance of the plants and the virus, but most of these viruses are vectored by insects. And of course, she's now in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology, and she totally fits all the descriptors for being in that, in our program. But she was um, originally a, a professor of plant pathology at Kansas State University, and she got an NSF uh, Early Career Development Award. Uh, to work on these molecular mechanisms of the virus vector interactions, which she's famous for. And, uh, but uh, <clears throat> beyond that, she also got an award at, at Kansas State for excellence in graduate training, but another one on increasing diversity in the sciences. And actually, she's brought that interest here, uh, where she's sort of, uh, sort of ratcheted up the Entomology and Plant Pathology Department's concerns about diversity. So she came here as a um, Chancellor's Faculty Excellent faculty member in 2017, along with her uh, long-term collaborator, Doris Rothenberg, and uh, they've been really uh, making a lot of progress here. Um, She's had funding from everywhere, from NSF, from USDA, um, and from the DARPA, which many of you are, are familiar with, and she'll talk about all of those things. Um, but um, it's great to have her here as actually an interdisciplinary scientist who's uh, been working all around. But I don't want to take any more of your time and have uh, you start. Thank you for the introduction, Fred and Jason, for the introduction speak here. Um, I just want to say that um, the slides are kind of a platform for discussion, so we can speed over some if we don't, if we run out of time. But definitely, um, you know, if you have questions throughout, make sure you just um, raise your hand or jump in, and I'll be happy to, to, to discuss my research with you as we go along. Um, and I just want to say that it's really exciting to be here um, with this um, interdisciplinary group. Um, actually, this Cluster was actually one of the, I looked at this cluster very carefully um, before I decided to move to NC State. And this was one of the one of the pros on the list for moving to NC State was that um, NC State has, uh, and this cluster has a vision for um, really um, educating and studying these new technologies and the impact that they will have on society. And so that's very important. Because I've been working on these 
as a basic scientist for over 20 years now. And it's um, what, I, what, I, what I've realized over the time is that really the advances in science are very challenging, but um, implementation and, and utilizing these tools is even more challenging. Mm. So um, it's really exciting to interact with this group. Okay, so we all, when we're plant pathologists and we study pests of plants, um, we always remind ourselves of this mission that we have to feed the future. And um, it's really important to understand that actually global pathogen and pest yield losses are quite significant. So as we're trying to increase food production by 70%, um, you can look at this recent paper. This is actually it was published just a few months ago, um, where they estimate that pathogen and pest yield losses are anywhere from 20 to 30% for the five major calorie crops that are grown. So um, these are a significant chunk out of that food production. And what we're trying to do is decrease the losses due to those pests and pathogens. Um, also of interest in this paper, what they really pointed out was that these highest losses are associated with food deficit regions with fast growing populations. So areas where the food is needed the most, we have the most losses. And they're associated with emerging and re-emerging pests and diseases. And you guys in this colloquium have talked about things like fall armyworm um, and um, Viruses like um, maize lethal necrosis and maize streak are like, just some of the types of pathogens affecting important crops like maize. So I study plant viruses that are transmitted by arthropod vectors. So for those of you who aren't that familiar with plant viruses, this is very similar to like what you think about with Zika virus. So the insect will feed on the plant, they acquire the virus, the virus replicates, and then they can transmit to a new plant host. And so there are some viruses that don't multiply in the vector, but they still are carried by the vector. But the ones that I study in particular are ones that are, are replicating in the insect. So the insect and the plant are a host. So these are very challenging to control. Um, we see changes in um, the vector geographic range um, due to things like globalization and climate change. We also have the emergence of new viruses. Viruses change very quickly. And so you can have um, selection on viruses, um, <coughs> new viruses um, that arise, and then the selection, if they're like better at being transmitted, they can really become a significant problem. Another thing about vector-borne um, <coughs> plant viruses is, is these are complex and dynamic pathosystems. And when I say that, I mean, so the plant is not only challenged with the virus, also, the insect generally, the <coughs> mite, would have an effect on the plant as well. Another thing about that is that commonly you'll see not only one virus disease, but multiple viruses that could be transmitted by the virus. So you're dealing with possibly multiple viruses and the pest, and this is a very big stress on the plant. And then hmm. there are limited control options. So there are no curative measures for plant viruses. Once a plant virus, a plant has a virus, um, there is no way to remove that virus from it. So either you kill the plant or you just live with the plant being infected. Um, but a lot of what we do um, and recommendations for growers are integrated pest management approaches where you take many different strategies to try and control the pest and the virus that it transmits. So what we're doing in my lab is studying the basic biology of these high priority plant diseases and trying to translate that knowledge into applied disease control strategies. So one of the most important viruses that we work on in my lab is tomato spotted bolt virus. So I'll talk about that for about two thirds of this talk and then I'll talk about some of the maze work that we're doing. Um, this virus has a global distribution so it's um, a problem all over the world, and it has a very, very wide host range. This virus infects over a thousand different plant species. Mm. There's only one other plant virus that infects more plant, virus, more plant hosts, and that's a virus called cucumber mosaic virus. So this is really important because it's everywhere, and it can infect many different plants, including like in North Carolina. Um, it's a big problem here because it can infect winter weeds and summer weeds, and so it's persistent in the environment year-round. And so 
what happens is then you plant a lush crop like tobacco in the field and those virulent thrips, the ones that can transmit the virus, um, can then move into your crop and transmit. And um, they also, um, the, here you can see the a tomato plant that's infected. So here this plant is not going to yield any um, product for the grower. Um, and there's no single effective control strategy. There is a resistance gene out there that's a common way to control a plant virus is if you get a good resistance gene, you use it. And, um, but for example, with tomato, there's a one dominant single gene that's used. And um, what we're seeing now is that it's widely used. And of course, now that virus is overcoming resistance. So just like any type of strategy, if you rely on one single gene, it often gets overcome. So that's why we always say um, good stewardship of these tools that are developed is super important for controlling um, viruses. Can I ask the gene yeah. that you mentioned, is that um, that's conventional? It's a conventional, or? yes, yes. It's, um, it's called SW5, and um, it's just widely, widely used. This I call this virus the influenza of the plant virus world because it has multiple segments and they can reassort, and so it can change really rapidly, and so it's been able to overcome that resistance. Yeah, I'm not a little technician, but I actually work at a greenhouse, so I've seen some of the plants that we try to grow. Yeah, we, we, were, we thought it was just sort of an aggressive variant, but mm -hmm. in my like, favorite plants where we saw um, Pythium occur, we also thought we also um, saw this around it, and yeah, you know, because there was a lot of rips in my pie. Mm -hmm. Sorry for that connection. Yes, if you grow plants in the greenhouse here, you're probably going to have thrips on them eventually. <laughs> I just want to point out one thing for our colleagues who aren't entomologists. Yes. Entomologists. So this is called tomato spotted wilt virus. Yeah, it attacks that more than a thousand plants. And we have this all the time because I work on the tobacco budworm, which is a major pest of cotton. <laughs> 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 you, know, a lot of our are, you might want to. So to say something about why do we call it tomato spider right. virus and why do we like scientific names? Right, right. Oh, yes. Well, actually, if you, okay, virus taxonomy is just somewhere you don't want to go. <laughs> 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 um, but because, I mean, right now we don't have Latin names for viruses. It, it, like, you just italicize tomato spider virus and that is the scientific name of the virus. So, so, and so there's a group pushing for Latinized binomials. Yes. But, but did anyway, it occur on tomato first? Yes, or? yes. Okay. So yeah. the way we name plant viruses is um, the first plant that you see it on and the symptoms that you see. So some in 1915, actually, <laughs> this virus was first described in Australia. Um, and it caused, it was on tomato and caused spots and wilt. And so here you can actually see <coughs> it wilting. And I'll show you some other pictures. It has really nice concentric rings. So actually it's a beautiful virus um, on the plant, if you're a plant virologist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, that's how we named these viruses. So then, of course, after they named it, they found it on many, many other plants. Um, and then I'll also say this is the thrips vector that transmits it. And as um, this gentleman mentioned, it it's also has a very wide host range, so it can feed on many plants and transmit the virus to it. And um, in the, so I think shortly, if not now, if you go out in North Carolina and look at any flower almost, you'll see these insects. And they're called the Western, or, or you might see a related one called Eastern flower thrips. But they, they like to feed on pollen, so you'll find them in, in pollen. I always find them flying at my classes. <laughs> I don't know, they somehow are attracted to my classes, so. Um. Okay, so I want to talk about in my group, uh, we are in with collaborators um, around the US. We are developing three different types of strategies for controlling plant viruses. One um, is um, starting with RNA interference. That's a very traditional approach. It's actually used in the field these days. Um, all the way to newer generation technologies like trying to disrupt the virus from getting into the insect and preventing transmission to plants. And um, we're doing some basic work trying to understand how the virus binds to the insect and how it gets in and what are the insect proteins that interact with the plant virus. And 
The idea is that if you understand those protein-protein interactions, you can develop ways to disrupt them. And then, um, as you can see, we're getting more and more um, complex. The idea is to turn insects and viruses into allies. And that is our um, DARPA-supported research. Um, and I'll just say that I also have an example at the end. They're actually using viruses right now to try and control citrus screening. Um, so that work is very far advanced. Um, our work with this project um, takes that a little bit further because we're trying to use the insect to deliver the recombinant virus to the plant. But still, it's, these are the emerging technologies that are out there and that could possibly be used in the field. So um, who in this room has heard of RNA interference for control of viruses? Okay, so most of you guys in this room are familiar with this technology. It's very straightforward and um, it's been in the field for many years now. Basically the idea is that you take your virus sequence, you look at the genome, and you pick out a piece of that genome to express as double-stranded RNA in the plant, and you make transgenic plants, and then you test them and you look for ones that are resistant to the virus. And so this has some commercial success. Um, right now you can get um, transgenic papaya, that, that's the most famous example where they have resistance to papaya ring spot virus. This has been used in the field for more than 20 years in Hawaii, and this has been some pretty durable resistance. So um, it seems like they have a unique um, vector virus combination there in Hawaii. Because I had just read that they've actually tried this in China, and after four or so years, they're actually seeing the resist resistance overcome. They have several different strains of the virus circulating, and so that might be the reason why it hasn't been durable. And then about 12% <coughs> of the summer squash that's produced in the US is actually transgenic. And I don't, most people don't know about that one. Um, I don't know if people that eat summer squash are that concerned, but um, I actually would like some of that seed for my garden. I always get those viruses that pop up in there. And then in Brazil, they're actually, um, using resistance to control uh, Gemini virus, gold, um, bean golden mosaic virus. And just an anecdote is I did talk to some of my colleagues in Brazil. And they said one interesting thing about these resistant plants is that when they started growing them, they then found new viruses that had been obscured um, by this, this is the primary virus pathogen, but now they found new viruses that um, they weren't aware of because of that disease. So it's always interesting when you deploy these technologies what you find. Um, <laughs> so um, I'll, maybe I'll just skip over this, but this is just the approach. You express the double-stranded RNA in the plant, um, and then it will then recognize the virus genome, um, either the genome um, or the messenger RNA in code that is made from the virus, and you'll have degradation of the virus and it effectively um, kills the virus. So it's a sequence specific technology um, and when you express this RNA in the plant, one nice thing that we like to say about it is that you're expressing RNA that you would be eating anyway if the virus was infected. So it's really not protein, you're not expressing any foreign proteins in the plant. So I think that's why um, it has been a relatively um, not, not as controversial as some genetic engineering techniques. Um, so we wanted to try this against tomato spotted wilt virus. And so, like I said, this is the influenza of the plant virus world. So our approach um, for this work was to do a lot of sequence analysis to identify the most conserved regions of the virus. Because we know that this virus changes so quickly, if we want to use something that's going to be effective against um, multiple viruses and durable. So how long can we use it in the field? We want to make sure we target the most um, robust regions of the virus genome. And we also decided we wanted to target multiple genes. So this, this is the virus particle, a cartoon of that. So actually what it has inside, it has three genome segments. We cleverly name them small, medium, large. So you're beginning to see my virologist really not that creative. We're just doing the obvious. Um, but on the, those three genome segments, and that's what can be a sort similar to, to influenza, 
Um, you have um, five different genes. So when we made our constructs, we targeted each of those virus genes. Um, and then we made the transgenic plants, and we're actually still in the progress, pro process of testing them. So um, this, is, and this is just to tell you a little bit about possible viruses. We like to, tomato spotted wolf virus is the most, um, like most commonly found virus and the most um, economically important. And so that's right here. This is a clade here. This is actually the clade of the Americas, and this is the Eurasian clade. So basically, these viruses all group together. They have similar insect vectors. Um, and geographic region, while well, these have a different type of vector. Um, mm -hmm. These are transmitted by a group called Franchinella, and these are transmitted more commonly by thrips. So these are the ones that are most important here in the US. Um, and so those are the sequences that we focused on in our bioinformatic analysis for conserved regions. So this is just summarizing the sequences that we use. So basically, we went to GenBank and to our collaborators who were generating new sequences, and we said, give us all your sequences. We want to compare them and find the most conserved regions, with the idea that those most conserved regions are the ones that would not change um, during um, and would be um, very stable as these viruses might change in nature. Okay, so this was the pipeline that we followed. We um, aligned the sequences and found those most conserved regions. Then what we did was we took those conserved regions and we said, what do we know about the biology of them? So actually, because there are people studying the molecular <coughs> biology of these viruses, we know that certain parts of proteins are not only conserved, but they have a conserved function as well. So they're active in something that the virus does like in replication of the genome or movement in the plants or transmission by the vector. So we looked for those spots too. So we overlaid con conservation with function. And then of course we looked for off-target potential. So that's important. We wanted to make sure that we would not target one, a plant gene. We didn't want to kill our plant. <laughs> and then two, um, we looked at other organisms as well. So it's really important to avoid um, off-target organisms that might be also feeding on pollen or, um, or on the plants. Okay. Well, okay, so that's what, so what we developed here was this hairpin construct that had a region for five different genes of the virus genome. So what we're hoping is that this will be broad-spectrum and durable resistance. Mm. So these are the results of some of our um, transmission assays. We actually inoculated the plants using thrips. Um, and these are the tests. So a high bar here just means that there was a lot of virus detected in those plants. So basically, these are our different constructs. We made several that we have A through F. And this was a control. This was actually a hairpin construct for GFP. So we had lots of these leaf discs that were um, of our control were infected with virus, while our hairpin constructs really seemed to come for resistance. But it's, this was the first generation of plants, so we did some more generations of tomato plants. And what we can see is that with this later generation, the TSWVD gene is no longer um, effective in conferring resistance to the virus. But our other genes are holding up, and so these are the controls as well. So we think these are some really promising um, sources of resistance for this <laughs> virus. And what we're doing now is um, whole plant assays, and we're sending our plants as soon as we get our BRS permit, <laughs> APHIS BRS permit, um, to our collaborators to test against other viruses. So one of our collaborators is in Florida, where they have so many other viruses, um, tospel viruses, that are infecting tomato, like tomato chlorotic spot virus, emerging virus. So we're going to see if these constructs will confer resistance to those as well. Okay. Yes? How many generations did you carry out for? We are now testing T3 generations. Um, so we had a small pause when we moved. <laughs> And I had to restaff our program, but um, now we're working on the T3s, um, and those experiments are going on right now. So, um, so far, so good. <laughs> okay. 
my question is going to be how far, how many generations will you go before you feel sort of satisfied that this has promise, you know, to not get overcome at T5 or, T, you know. Right, right. I, so I think that right now we think our populations are homozygous. So we're thinking that now it's beginning to be stable in, in the plant. And what we want to test more of, like where we want to focus our effort, is testing different viruses um, with that vary in their genetic relatedness to what, what we design them to. So I think um, that's what's most interesting for us right now. Um, but yeah, good question. Well, even if it's stable in the plant, you know, the virus is always, you know, mutated right. as well. And so, like, are, is there some why would it being stable in the plant sort of be the end of that okay. type of evaluation? Well, I think, okay, so the idea is that it's stably expressed in the plant. And so we, once it's stable in the plant, we think that the gene in the plant won't change, right? But the viruses will change. So what we think is it, really important is to do is to test those plants once it's the plant is kind of the same is to try all these different isolates of virus or different species of viruses and um, one of the goals is like to test like the resistance breaking strains that are out there that at that traditional resistance gene sw5 can we now have a good source of resistance for those growers who no longer have a good source of resistance and this was part of a USDA CAP project. So really the goal of these genes is not just to have one transgenic gene in, available. We actually want, we actually, um, we're working with a tomato reader at Cornell, Mark Vilmersla Chu, and then um, George Kennedy here at NC State. They were developing other types of resistance that are more traditional with um, using the SW5, there's another gene, SW7, and actually, these compounds made by the plant acyl sugars, which are kind of anti-thrips, and they can deter um, feeding and overposition and maybe even transmission of the virus. So what our goal really is to do is to put all those together. So to have a multigenic approach um, mm. to for control of these viruses. Um, Thank you, Kristen. Yeah. Could you just go back one slide? Yeah. I just wonder. So where the TSWV-D, Yes. so is that because the, it, it lacked the stability in the plant? Or, I mean, because two generations, it seems like that's not very many generations. Or right. Was it resistance developed to the Well, we, Well, we need to go back now and look at those plants and see if we no longer have transgene expression um, and how high is the level of expression. Or, and the, the, the thing to know about this is that as small RNAs, those are the little things that are the um, executors of defense. Are we still making high levels of small RNAs? And so that's one of the things that um, a po new postdoc in my lab is doing. Actually, mm -hmm. going over to Tim's lab to do some northern blots, um, but to look for these small RNAs. Because really making lots of those small RNAs is the sign that you're going to have good resistance. So we really, that's the looking at what happened here is one of the questions. And this that, commonly occurs. Okay. That graph is just basically a function of the transformation and then the stability. You're using the same virus. The virus has to mutate. Right. Right. Yeah. We're using the same the virus. Of the, of the right. Trait. Yes. So is that a micro RNA strategy? No. It's not a micro you RNA You said there's small RNA. Just a small RNA. Big, we use actually um, pieces of over 100 base pairs of each gene. We are weary of the micro strategy because really when you have the, a micro RNA strategy, you actually only have, I think, what, 20 or so nucleotides that match the virus. And there are um, experiments, not with tomato spider wilt virus, mm -hmm. but with a Cody virus. They made one micro RNA in a plant and like in two passages of the virus, that resistance was overcome. Mm -hmm. So, um, we wanted to make sure we were expressing bigger pieces of RNA for long how, stability. How many nucleotides need, need to be mutated to lose the, the compatibility for the double-stranded RNA? Okay, 
Can so from that, from that double strand RNA you're designing for you know, targeting the, the, the virus, how many nucleot nucleotides need to be mutated to lose there, the resistance? We have over 800 nucleotides that match the virus in five different genes in mm. ours. So, um, but do you know how many does the, 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 the virus need to mutate to break that compatibility? And, and break the we resistance? would need to do tests to kind of to, to determine that. The idea is though is that you're, so you would probably, that, that would be the next phase of this research with the bio, with you know, additional funding to um, repeatedly passage this virus on these plants to see if it would be um, stable resistance. So um, yes, that's a very good question. But like I said, that's the reason we targeted multiple genes. So we're targeting the polymerase. So if you think that, and that's a conserved region that's actually active and replicating the, the virus genome. So that, and that's one of the primary targets by a lot of these, um, these technologies is to target the polymerase. Because if you kill the polymerase, the, the virus won't be able to replicate or transcribe its, its mRNAs. Um, but like I said, that's why we targeted five different genes. These viruses are, are have a high capacity for change. Well, are they genes or gene fragments? We're targeting genes, but these are piece nucleotides. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I may have lost something. Okay. Each of these are different events with the same construct, or each we, of these is. Okay. We have different constructs actually. We targeted for each. So what we did here. Um, so I'll just go back to the virus genome. So actually, when we looked at the M, the M segment encodes two proteins, actually three proteins, but it has two genes, and this one has two genes, and this one has one. So for each one of those, we picked two different conserved spots, and then we assorted, the, we combined them in different ways to make our different constructs. Because a lot of what you can find is that sometimes um, you just need to determine empirically what is the best sequence to target. Yeah. And we did as many predictive tools as we could. We tried to predict which ones would be really effective at making siRNAs, but there's only so much bioinformatics yeah. and, and um, in silico analysis we can do, and then you have to go and try it in, in the lab. But theoretically, yeah. each of those constructs you showed us is targeting multiple genes. Yes, each one is targeting five genes yeah. in the That's virus, it, yeah. yes. So we'll see. <laughs> ah. uh, so far, so good, like I said. Okay, I'm going to look at the time. 12.34. 12.34, okay, because we have to end at 12.50. Well, we usually go to one. Yeah. Okay. We typically go to one, but we like to have a lot of time to talk. Right, <laughs> so what I think I might just I'll give you an overview of this, because I do want to talk about the DARPA work that we're doing. Yeah. yeah. But basically, this is the transmission cycle for this virus. So what the interesting thing about it is that these first instar thrips are the ones that can acquire the virus. As they mature, they lose their ability to acquire the virus. So one thing I always like to point out is that if we can block the virus from getting in at this early stage, we can prevent virus transmission. So that's a really neat thing about this virus, and it makes these control strategies that we're trying to develop a little bit more tractable that they might work in the field. So basically what we're doing is um, we're taking the virus particle and we know that the there are proteins on the surface that are involved in binding and entry into the insect gut and we've used those to block the virus from getting in. And now what we've done is we've taken that glycoprotein that attaches and fished out the thrips proteins that interact. And so now we have connect candidates to target to prevent the virus from getting in on the vector side as well. But um, I think I'll save that for another day, because I, <laughs> I, do, <laughs> I do want to, to um, talk about this work. I need to tell you that Anna yes. cut down the number of slides. <laughs> 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 this is 26. <laughs> It was 50. Well, we interrupted you. So. Oh, that's true. Enough, that's right? true. We've already been asking Okay. That's, okay. that's a good sign, though. Right? <laughs> yes, yes, when, yes. when you have this much interaction that you, you, have, you get to skip some slides. 
Okay, so um, this is project is we're a subcontract with Ohio State. They're the lead institute, and um, it's a contract with DARPA, and they have this insect allies program. And so they came out with this call for um, scientists to take out this challenge. And um, this was my first time ever working on one of these types of projects. Um, and I'll just say the, the the RFA is very different. They don't even call it an RFA, right? It's BFA or yes, I can't even remember the acronym. A lot of acronyms associated with this work. But so the challenge that they gave us was to take a plant infecting virus and use it to carry um, some genes to the plant that would um, then protect the plant from a stress, either huh. abiotic or biotic. Then the second, so the, that's the first challenge. I'll just say plant viruses are extremely small compared to animal viruses, most animal viruses on the average. So, and a lot of them are icosahedral, and so they can't carry a lot of extra material in them. Um, so what we've had to do is really um, do a lot of work to try and get the viruses to carry more information on them. So that's the biggest challenge for the virus, is getting it to carry these pieces of information. Uh -huh. It's a new genetic material. So the second challenge is to deliver these viruses that are now bigger than they were before by insect vectors um, to plants. But we also want the insects to be genetically modified so that they will transmit the virus and then die and not spread the virus to non-target crops. Um, so that's developing these transgenic insects. So, and I'll say the challenge here is we're working with plant feeding insects. Um, they don't like to feed on membranes. <laughs> they don't do well at all. Um, so on, on, or on artificial diets, they really want to feed on the plant. Um, so that's a big challenge. I'll say our, I'm sure our transgenic collaborators back there are nodding their heads. <laughs> our say and her team, Nathaniel. Um, so this is this has been very interesting. And then um, for the plant side, is we want to take mature or beyond seedling plants and be able to protect them from either a drought, a pathogen, or a pest. Hmm. So, um, like I said, I call this the Moonshot Project that we're working <laughs> on in our lab. We're really pushing the boundaries of what we can do with science. And so, in that way, it's, it's very exciting. Um, it's an exciting project to be on. And I'll just say, I'm a little more optimistic than I was six months ago about our prospects for this project. I still don't know if we'll make it all the way to the end, but I'm, I'm feeling better as we go along. It's amazing what you can do um, with the right team of people. And so that I just want to um, introduce the people working on this project. We, everybody has a project name, and our project is Team <coughs> Maze Hopper. Um, so this is our Maze Hopper up here. That's not a real insect, but <laughs> I think it's very cute. Um, so we have our virus team, and this is led by Lucy Stewart. So Tim Sit over here oh, he's sitting is, over there. is um, <laughs> part of this phase of the project as well. And then um, our biggest team is the vector team. I lead that. Um, you see Marseille here and Max are really important in developing the transgenic insects. So um, we needed all the expertise that we could get from NC State um, to work on this project. Um, and then Dorit and Austri <coughs> and a lot of the ecology, and there's a lot of just basic transmission work that has to go on um, to meet these objectives. Because one thing is you have to have high transmission efficiency of these viruses. You have to, you have to tweak every different condition to maximize those steps. And then our project directors are actually from Ohio State. They're Peg Redenbaugh and Go Liang Wong, and they're the, leading the plant side of the project, and Peter Bell and Curdy here at NC State with USDA ARS. So I think we've got a really great team to tackle this um, challenging project. So um, the goals of the project are to develop these virus systems for stable expression of heterologous sequences in maize, 
And I'll just say we started out with nine viruses, and now we've prioritized that to four. So in this little cartoon, I just want to point out we have different shapes of viruses. And that's really important because like, a lot of plant viruses are like this. They're icosahedral. But then some are these flexuous rods that you see here. And so what we're finding is that those viruses with the long rise, they can actually get bigger and bigger and bigger. Huh. And so those are the ones that are most effective at carrying the foreign genes that we need. Um, and we'll be pushing that because we're going to try to express Cas9 from the plant virus. So a lot of these plant viruses are like 10 KB, and Cas9 is 4 KB. So we're... It, It'll be interesting to see if we can achieve that goal. Um, and then with the vector, we started out with seven insects and we've narrowed that to three. And I'll, I, that's a significant step, but our, our transgenic team tells us that's still a, a big number. There's, a, there's an extra challenge here with the aphid because they don't um, routinely make eggs. And one way you make transgenic insects usually is you inject the eggs with the, with the genetic material that you want to use to alter them. And if you don't make eggs, that's a really, really big problem. So we're trying an alternative approach to kill the endosymbiont, and then the insect wouldn't live as long. So they could maybe, the goal is to have them transmit the virus and then die, because they no longer have their endosymbiont that produces essential amino acids that enable them to survive. Um, so that's. That's a, a, a workaround, but eventually we will have to make those transgenic aphids, I think, by the, by the end of our project. Okay. And then um, for our maize phenotypes, we're working on um, disease and drought resistance. And um, well, we always like to highlight that all of this <coughs> is done inside. None of this is done, even it, right now, even in a greenhouse. All the work is done inside growth chambers, inside laboratories with APHIS PPQ and APHIS VRS permits. And at this time, there's no plan to use any of this in the field. Um, this is all um, in, the, in the biosecurity level. Two or three greenhouse will be as close to the real world environment as this project will get, just because there, is, there are concerns um, about uh, using it, it, as we say, it's a genetically modified system. It's not just an organ, one organism. We're dealing with a system here. Okay, so I just want to point out that this is not so far off from reality. They're actually currently using plant viruses to try <clears throat> and fight citrus greening disease in Florida. So what they've done is they have this virus that infects citrus called citrus tristeza virus. And it's a, one of, another one of those long rod viruses, so it can <coughs> hold foreign genes. And so what they've done is they've taken that virus genome and added a spinach defense gene. And this gene confers resistance to the bacterium that causes citrus greening. The nice thing about this virus is that they actually have very, very low aphid transmission efficiency. So what they're doing to transmit this virus is they actually take a plant and they graft on the plant that's infected with the virus that has the protective qualities. And so this is actually um, being used in the field. Um, and this is actually very interesting reading. I read this uh, part of this document. So really interesting case study. Um, you're not here. Did you read about this? I read about this. Yeah. 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 So, so it's very cool. So basically, it's really showing that what we're doing with our Insect Allies project is not too far from maybe what could possibly be used to protect plants. Um, so, and the, this came out last week. So this is the alternative, maybe, to a, tr a transgenic virus. is spraying lots of antibiotics. <laughs> Tons, I think, is what they say, onto citrus. And um, from these reports, they don't eat the spraying antibiotics on these plants is marginally successful, if at all successful, at controlling this disease. So um, I think this is a, a very important concern as we look to the future and think about all the different options we have for controlling these emerging pests. Um, so what is our best option for control? 
I'll just point out uh, also that the CTV, the recombinant virus that they discussed, in some ways, um, I was, I've, I've listened to citrus producers and they feel better about using these recombinant viruses than using transgenic plants. Somehow those are interpreted as being more um, consumer friendly than a transgenic plant, which mm. is really <coughs> interesting. Does the use of that transgenic virus not make it fall under the guidelines that would require it to get labeled you know, under the new labeling standard? For the G for GM labeling? Right, the whole bio smiling sun thing. You know? <laughs> I would have to look that up. I don't know, but I would think, yeah, I'd have to look that one up. That's, be a big... That could go either way. I mean, I, I, yeah. And is it the EPA that regulates antibiotics use as a, what, what regulatory system is the antibiotic use in citrus? It's just interesting. I'll have to look that up, but I know they got an emergency declaration for this. Wow. So. It, it's EPA. Yeah, EPA. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So is that an avirulent trisaza? Yes, it, it, Interesting. It, it's mostly a weird one. <laughs> but they say most of the most of the citrus will have citrus to say that and <clears throat> cross protection actually in many countries they actually use citrus to say that to control a mild strain to control against a virulent strain. Mm -hmm. So these types of strategies have been used for for disease control for a while now. Maybe not so much in the US. Can, can I ask a question? Uh, um, uh, it goes back to this. I, I was faculty in Florida, so I'm very familiar with this case. And okay. um, I would challenge, just based on the conversation that we had with consumers there, uh, that this would be a more controversial approach. Because one of the things with risk assessment that people like to see or, or evaluate is control over whatever you are using as a trade. So why is this a better system? Then just put the trace directly in the plant that you have control over. You don't need to induce drought tolerance in, in corn. If you can control the expression in your plant, then you have control over your crop. The same for citrus. So I, I think the potential is way higher for target species that you have no control. So, for example, I'm a wheat scientist. So, this right. is great if I want to target wheat control or kill weeds because I don't know where the weeds are. I have no control where they are. So the, the vector will find the, 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 the target species and help me manage it. But in a crop that I'm planting and I have full control over it, why would this be a, a better option? I'm not saying it's a better option. It's another option. But I will say one of the reasons why I think the CTV is appealing is because um, it's faster than making transgenic plants. It's easier to inoculate this plant with, you could probably go to whatever genotype you were, or plant cultivar you were interested in and put that virus into it and see if it works. And you could give someone um, quite rapidly a like, protective measure against that disease. So that is much faster in that way. Um, and then you can also, um, with the idea between, uh, about insect allies, is that the real challenge there is that you want to take a crop that's already planted and change it, not change the genetics of the plant. It would be a fast response to an emerging threat. It's kind of the, the philosophy behind that. Yeah, but well, growers, growers are going to prefer to have the trade in their genetics from the beginning than taking the chance of having to do the calculation. <coughs> so can I bounce off that real quick? Yeah. To what you mentioned acceptance by orange growers, to what degree is that because we're talking orchards which take years to develop versus, you know, corn growers that would maybe <coughs> let's scrap the crop this year and think about next year? Well, well, citrus growers basically they don't have a problem with, get, with transgenic trees. It's just that the consumers already said no, it's not going to happen. So, uh, and, right. and, and they have renovated orchards multiple times already. Right. I, I'm thinking, you know, transitionally, you already have the trees, they've already grown, 
they were doing fine and then they got the graining. Can I treat the trees I have now <coughs> and like plan for the future while the technology? But you can inoculate them mechanically, right? Yeah. I would think so. The, the, the virus, I could inoculate a tree mechanically. Well, it, yeah, she mentioned well, the, graph the not mechanical, oh. transmissible by graph transmission. Mm -hmm. Those are two di two different types of transmission. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Fred, I already yeah. Sorry, I just like to pick up on Ramon's comment that. You could use your system that you're developing to kill leaves, right? So that instead of the insect transmitting a virus that does some nice thing, it could actually be targeted to that weed and, and kill that weed. Or, or you may see the species. Which, would, which, or, or, yeah. Yeah. which yeah, yeah. could be great for that, but of course it brings up the idea that, oh, DARPA, right? Well, right. Geez, <laughs> you could you develop see? this <laughs> to right. kill Russian weed, right? <laughs> I mean, just bring up use issues. Right, right. So it might be easier to kill wheat someplace than to help wheat. So, just like we developed 220 sure to kill rice, which basically we did the rice, so we tried to do it. Yeah, yeah. So, which we did try to do it. you to comment on what, what you're thinking in terms of, I'm sure dual use issues have come up in this project. Yes, dual use issues have come up, and there's an LC uh, ethics. Yeah legal yeah. and, and societal impact panel that we meet with routinely and and so you know that's a concern yeah. right because someone could take something that we are only using for beneficial to protect plants ensure food security and we for something bad i'll just say the idea of making recombinant viruses to express foreign genes has been in in process for many many years yeah. Um, so I think the new twist on it here is the insect to deliver it. Um, but one of the things I would say is that it's a very time-consuming project and we're not there yet. Um, so I like to think that if someone was really trying to hurt our food supply, it would be easier, less laborious and expensive um, um, Targets, but I will say that that is an issue that we are very aware of and is on our radar. Yeah, and we discuss it as a as a group. Um, yeah. So, so I know like open release isn't part of your mandate in this project, but sort of thinking ahead to you know you're doing this for a reason, you know, and so like you know thinking ahead, are they engaging any producer groups, for example, like maize growers or any of the row crop growers that are relevant for the uh, insects you're looking at to sort of see how the beneficiaries of this sort of new insect vector technology might actually think about it? That is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> and so the answer, we at this point, you know, um, we are not working with grower groups, um, but I think there's always potential for more interaction that's you know, kind of the point of the center, and we're going to actually host our technical interchange meeting here on May 14, and it's not open to the public, but I think if some of the members of this um, cluster and this group were interested in participating, please come see me, and I'll, you know, work to get you on, on signed up for the meeting. Anyone who attends has to sign a non-disclosure agreement, and all these other things that are very important, because everybody's talking about sensitive technologies. But I think that I think that um, we would all benefit from additional insight into the implications of this and how people are going to react to it. Because if you probably maybe some of you read in science, and Fred had a quote in oh, one okay. of the responses <laughs> that that a group actually um, in Europe um, caught on to this project and they were they were very upset by it. Um, one thing they were worried about was seed transmission of these viruses. And most of these viruses we're working with are not really seed born, so. Um, they were worried about the next generation of plants um, having these recombinant viruses and different things like that. And I think they interpreted the project from the DARPA website. I think their interpretation was that we were, were going to do field release, and that is not the case at all. Yeah. So, yeah, we were in the we were in the news a little bit. I want to think that you were, yeah, thank you in reference when you were deal, showing us the different different viruses, the graph. Right. And you mentioned about that that research moving forward <laughs> and permitting uh, or achieving permits. I don't know if you said BRS, I think you did. 
Uh, I was wondering if you could if you could clarify that. Oh, the viruses we're saying. working with. Okay, yeah. so for this, for any project that we're working with, um, if you move a virus across state lines, you have to get a permit from the, the APHIS PP2 to move just wild type virus. Because you're moving this to a new place, and you want to make sure you don't release that. So that's one step. And then you have APHIS BRS, and they regulate the um, genetically modified um, organisms that you might be working, just working within your lab or transporting. And so you have to go through these extensive um, procedures to document that, um, and they can actually come in your lab and do an inspection mm -hmm. and make sure that you won't release anything and that you're doing every, destroying everything in the proper way so that you don't release these organisms into the environment. So those are the, that's what I was talking about with these permits. And those are all just for working with in your lab under, in, you know, the, like Marseille's group, they had to come and like make sure there was no place for escape of the insects and, you know, just constantly upgrading um, so you don't have any accidental releases. We're all very, very conscious of that. One question. Um, so part of that pathway was to design an insect that would then would feed, feed or transmit and then die. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard, I mean, unless the insect has really specific, um, ho like, host preference, if you release the insect, I mean, it's not only going to go to the, your target plants, right? So it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a little strange to me because it seems like, how much are you really going to control the spread of whatever this insect is um, infecting because you can't control the insect? Right. Right. So, so we're working with aphids and leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, and those the range of insects that we're working with. Um, like the, the goal of the transgenic team is to develop conditional lethals, so that once they are taken off of like this antibiotic or some other substrate, they will die shortly after. So that's the idea that they would then you could release them. The scenario would I, I imagine would be to release them into a field, and they would live long enough to transmit to that crop and then die, because you removed that um, that repressor, and then they'd have a lethal gene expressed that would kill them. So the idea is by the end of this project is to have two of those genes, a double threat to the insect, not just one mechanism. So they really want to make sure that they don't move forward um, into a next generation. Um, but the other thing is that that was something we took into account, host specificity, when we selected our insects. Um, and so we actually have a range of insects from really host-specific, um, like maize. So mm -hmm. Davios matis was one of our initial ones that we chose, and that's the corn um, leafhopper. And it's very host-specific. Mm -hmm. Some of the others, like Rockholosaccopatae, the aphid that we're working with, is not as host-specific. These are all monocot-eating um, insects. But yes, that, and that's one goal of the project, actually, is to possibly make the insects more host specific. So, but right now we're just trying to get the basics done, but that is something we're thinking about. And I'm sorry I took the last question, but we, I'm, I'm sure that Anna would be happy to talk to people after. Please join me and thank you. Um, I know our GS Center is always looking for more faculty on campus to affiliate with us and to cooperate with us. So it's really wonderful to meet you. Thank you all for coming. Um, and next week, I believe we're hearing from um, uh, the Denise and Carly. Yes, on the Center for Regulation. So an initiative that keeps in the room. There you are. Yeah. Until you come in, that you really spearheaded. Um, and so this is an exciting new initiative that parallels some of the goals of GES. And so we'll have a speaker.